El punto número siete es la situación del Estado de Derecho en Polonia. Bienvenidos a este importante intercambio de opiniones sobre la situación del Estado de Derecho en Polonia. Una cálida bienvenida y el agradecimiento a nuestros distinguidos oradores e invitados hoy, a quienes deseo agradecer su disponibilidad y flexibilidad para conectarse con nosotros a distancia en nombre de la Comisión Libre, en nombre de su presidente. Este intercambio de opiniones se organiza en el marco del procedimiento de aprobación del Parlamento sobre la determinación de un riesgo claro de violación grave del Estado de Derecho por parte de la República de Polonia. Es decir, por el procedimiento del artículo 7.1 de los tratados iniciado por la Comisión Europea en diciembre del año 2017. La Comisión Libe ha decidido redactar un informe provisional en el marco de este procedimiento de consentimiento y está organizando el intercambio de opiniones para informar los procedimientos sobre este informe. El presidente de esta Comisión Libe, el señor López Aguilar, ha sido nombrado ponente. Antes de dar la palabra a nuestros distinguidos oradores, cederé la palabra al ponente, a nuestro presidente, al señor López Aguilar, para que exponga brevemente algunas de las preocupaciones del Parlamento sobre, la, sobre el expediente en curso. El presidente, señor López Aguilar, tiene usted la palabra. ¿Me escucha? Presidente. Good morning. Tiene usted la palabra. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you all. I wish you well and I hope you're all in good faith and willing to see you soon. Let me begin with uh, saluting the uh, presence here in this important point in the order day of the Libre Committee agenda of Minister of Justice of the Republic of Poland, Mr. Ziobro, which is actually taking the floor right afterwards. Of course, Commissioner Didier Reinders, Commissioner for Justice, Irene Andrasa as Ambassador of the Croatian Presidency, and Professor Adam Botner, Polish Commissioner for Human Rights. But let me begin, begin with by, by stating the case. I'm sure you know that uh, it is Article 7.1, Paragraph 1 of the procedure in relation to Poland. So I can only express my concern about the state of rule of law in Poland and its repercussions on the state of democracy, human rights in the country. The reform of the Polish justice system carried out by the Polish government since 2015 was done in breach of the rule of law, one of the core values laid down in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. I'm stating here the case that has been endorsed by the European Parliament in a number of resolutions, including the plenary. While the organization of the justice system is a national competence, we all know that national judges are essentially also European judges. So they are entrusted with the relevant function of implementing and applying union law, and therefore the cornerstone of the European judicial system. And that is why the Union, the EU, including the European Court of Justice, have to watch over the independence of the judiciary in all of the member states in order to comply with Article 47 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. While there are different forms of organization of national justice systems, and that is conceivable, the reform of the Polish justice system effectively amounted to a politicization of the justice system. Uh, uh, that is why the executive, the justice uh, 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 executive in, in, in Poland has been increasing dramatically its grip on the judiciary. And I put forward all of the component elements of the, of the situation, systematically nominating judges loyal to the government into top positions, in the highest courts, in the common courts, in the National Council for the Judiciary, which plays a pivotal role in further nominating of judges. 
by refusing to publish important judgments of the Constitutional Tribunal, the Constitutional Court, issued before it was heavily politicized by initiating disciplinary proceedings against judges who speak out about the reforms who implement European Court of Justice judgments, for which a wide ground was created by the recent adoption of the so-called Muzzle Law, which prevents judges, Polish judges, to implement or apply European law as it is their duty and by interfering in the organization of the courts as another way of disciplining critical judges. These reforms and these developments have been widely criticized not only by the European Parliament, because we have been following the whole situation, but also by the UN bodies, the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe, of which, of course, the Republic of Poland happens to be a member too, and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, the OSCE, and the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the European Commission and the European Parliament. Several judgments by the European Court of Justice, which is the highest uh, uh, body to interpret and secure the application, the uniform application of the European law, have been showing that the Polish government has to follow the way. But the government so far has refused to backtrack of any of the reforms except the lowering of the retirement age of the sitting judges at the Supreme Court. Most recently, April the 8th, the European Court of Justice has honored the Commission's request for interim measures suspending the functioning of the so-called disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court. It's not clear yet how is the Polish government going to react. Just two days ago, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal, the Polish Constitutional Court, decided at the request of the Polish government that the Supreme Court's decision implementing the European Courts of Justice preliminary ruling of November 16, 2019, concerning the disciplinary chamber of the court and the National Council for the Judiciary, runs counter the Polish Constitution. That is a decision of the Polish Constitutional Court that has to be also complied with, just naturally so. When there is a constitutional court, it is the highest body to interpret the national member state constitution and therefore binding for all of the bodies, institutions, and of course the political institutions of the relevant member state, which is the case of Poland. And this is turning the principle of primacy of European law upside down, constituting a grave and serious threat to the European multi-layered legal order. While the focus today in this meeting is on the rule of law, I would also like to emphasize the flaws in the justice system increasingly spilling over into flaws in democracy and violation of fundamental rights. The members of the Libe Committee, which is our committee, have shown concern. We are all worried about the amendments to the electoral legislation ahead of the presidential election next month, instructing people to vote by postal services in view of the COVID-19 epidemics. It is essential that the elections are held fair and equal, transparent, credible in every possible way after a genuine election campaign. It is not sure by now that the current circumstances allow for this to happen. Some member states have resorted to extraordinary measures to postpone elections, which were already underway for good reason, because there are no circumstances to, to keep up to a credible free election in, will, in which all of the citizens of the relevant member states are allowed not only to take part, but also for the political parties to compete to each other in fair, in fair competition. We have also learned about the offer to the opposition in Poland to amend the constitution in order to extend the term of office of the Polish presidency with another two years in turn for calling off the elections. Equally concerned are the ones related to the role of the extraordinary control and public affairs chamber of the Supreme Court in the supervision of the super of presidential elections. 
judges, uh, the, 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 this chamber has been composed of judges in a similar manner as the disciplinary chamber. Risks not only qualify as independent tri tribunal, should be put to the assessment of the Court of Justice, of the European Court of Justice as it was the case of the disciplinary ch chamber before. Furthermore, in the midst of co COVID-19 outbreak, the legislation is being tabled or pushed through human rights sensitive areas, not linked with the health crisis, with the sanitary crisis. We fear, therefore, potential ab abuse of the fact that citizens cannot organize or protect publicly against the bills containing severe restrictions on sexual education and the right to abortion, as they successfully did in the past. This would seriously undermine, in our view, the legitimacy of the legislation adopted, aggravated by the fact that independent constitutional review can no longer be effectively guaranteed, as we have seen. So the concern is perfectly on its feet. It's well grounded. There are many more human rights concerns to mention. Lack of independent, impartial, and diverse and diverse content of Polish public service media, restriction on the freedom of assembly, including the time of the Katowice, Katowice Climate Change Conference in Presidente, vaya terminando. The shrinking space and funding for critical civil society organization, hate speech against public identifying as LGBTI, that's important for us, by public authorities, as well as declaration of LGBT ideology free zones, which could lead, I'm, I'm quoting, to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. That is why we are simply eager. We're all Presidente, le voy a cortar la palabra. Speakers to hear their views and, ex and exchange our concerns, and of course take note of every point that is going to be made from now onwards. Thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias, Presidente. Bien, vamos a ver. Recibimos anoche la noticia de que el ministro, eh, el ministro Jobro podría participar, participar finalmente hoy. Y mm, es el primero de nuestros oradores invitados. Es el ministro de Justicia de la República de Polonia. Y resulta de suma importancia que las opiniones de las autoridades polacas sean escuchadas en detalle en el marco de un enfoque eficaz y equilibrado en virtud del procedimiento del artículo 7.1 de los tratados. Señor Chobro, ministro, tiene usted la palabra por 15 minutos. ¿Está usted escuchando? Muy bien, muchísimas gracias. Bienvenido, ministro. Tiene usted la palabra. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I would like to welcome all the representatives of the European Commission and peace uh, experts who are present. Today, it is my pleasure to be able to address you. Uh, I would like to um, respond to uh, reiterated concerns and reservations about the changes in the area of the justice system that the government that I represent is introducing. To me, it is an opportunity to briefly, at least briefly, to respond to a number of misunderstandings or misconceptions, some distorted information that has reached uh, the European public opinion, sometimes in good faith, sometimes in not so good faith. They are repeated as arguments uh, saying that the rule of law is being in breach, that democracy is being in breach, is breached in uh, my country by the government that I represent in the form of our judiciary reform. Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me start by giving you a diagnosis of the issue. It is no doubt that the judiciary reform was um, discussed and was uh, uh, talk, 
it was uh, discussed by a number of political parties that have been winning uh, free elections in the democratic in our democratic country. All those parties talked about them. All those parties had the judicial reform as their priority. But each time there was a judicial reform, there was a big social dissatisfaction following consistently for dozens of years in Poland. We've had uh, polls conducted by different political groups, uh, conducted by uh, professional institutes and institutions that measure the satisfaction of the Polish society with the judiciary. And consistently, we see that the way the society sees uh, or perceives the judiciary and the way courts are working, well, their satisfaction is falling. Uh, rather than increasing. And we're talking about, well, when we poll uh, trust and confidence in the judiciary and courts, uh, when we are, when the Polish societies asked about lengthy proceedings, corruption, scandals uh, in the community of judges, well, all those polls and, uh, well, the public opinion uh, has led to the fact that all political parties that attempted a reform of judiciary always failed because they focused on something outside of the main, of, of the key problem, of the major problem that we have in our judiciary. So the reforms that have followed uh, were about, for example, procedural simplifications. So namely to simplify proceedings. Definitely the budget of the judiciary has been boosted, and I think it's a good direction. Uh, in our um, time, we have also improved the budget for the judiciary. Uh, when we look at salaries of judges or other uh, associates, employees of the judiciary system, it's all been improved, but it hasn't brought desirable results yet. Like when we look at uh, decisions of the um, Court of Justice in Strasbourg, we are, when it comes to, uh, we are right now among the first countries uh, that uh, are deemed not to guarantee a quick Quick proceedings to make sure that uh, and, uh, to make sure that citizens feel safe. So let us look at some objective data. Poland, in the meantime, has become a country that's been considered number six when it comes to our GDP and expenditures towards judiciary. So we are number six in terms of expenditures compared to GDP. But on the other hand, we are one of the last when it comes to efficient efficiency of proceedings. Plus, there has been a growing outrage uh, among the Polish society uh, hearing from the media about all the different corruption scandals. Like, for example, there was this big scandal about uh, cassation of verdicts in the civil uh, chamber of the uh, Supreme Court. So this has not, well, the judge responsible was never brought to uh, liability. Also, there was another scandal about a regional court, a scandal in a regional court that where uh, former Prime Minister Tusk or his family members were involved. And there was a conversation where a judge was supposed to fix the composition of the said court, of the said panel. So... Uh, there have been uh, road accidents and car crashes caused by uh, judges driving under the influence. So anyway, there all the cases where judges are in breach of their ethical standards, all such cases have to lead to lack of satisfaction and lack of confidence, and we need to rebuild it. So in the face of failures of all governments, 
so far, our government in 2015, after the election, decided to put this matter at the top of its agenda. And we decided to change the judiciary. But to do that, we needed to have a credible diagnosis. So we were wondering about the roots, root causes of problems in the judiciary. Let me mention two people that are not linked to me politically. Uh, the former uh, chairman of the uh, Constitutional Court, he used to be uh, connected to the civic civil platform party, so this professor, this judge, in his article in the Gazeta Wyborcza Daily in 2004, he described the state of the judiciary back then. I quote, media inform us about quite a lot of uh, corruption scandals, drunk judges who come to work, to court, drunk, or who drive under the influence. They inform us about judges who commit offenses. So far, our law and our corrective measures are helpless vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the mentality of uh, the highest structures, echelons of our judiciary. So this professor, Professor Zeplinski, who later went on to become the uh, president of the uh, Constitutional Court, at that point he said that the National Judiciary Council was not a council that defends the independence of the judiciary. He said it was a national trade union that preserves interests that harm the Polish judiciary. So can you imagine a more uh, incisive and more critical account when, and I share that point of view, back then when Professor Stempin was uh, proposing his changes, those changes were not introduced by governments that followed. But to be consistent, I will quote another um, president, um, chairman of the Constitutional Court, Professor Stempin, uh, who used to be appointed by previous parliaments who were completely different than our parliament right now. But this former a president of the Constitutional Court in 2014 said that the National Judiciary Council was not serving or was serving the interests of the judiciary badly. Uh, he was very strict, very severe in his criticism. I'm not going to read the entire quote due to uh, my time limit. Well, the Civic Platform uh, Party, uh, when it was ruled by Donald Tusk, uh, a figure that's known to you. Uh, there is a document published back then, a uh, profound uh, restructuring of the state. There was a judiciary reform proposed back then. Uh, maybe you'll find it interesting. According to the Civic Platform Party, the biggest problem in the Polish judiciary was the large the corporate mechanisms uh, like the National Judiciary Council that was uh, not functioning appropriately. We changed that, so I'm adding this. So back then, um, in this document, they were saying that the National Judiciary Council, instead of uh, defending independence of courts and judges, it was failing which led to irresponsibility or uh, it leads to the fact that judges who break the law are not brought to justice, apart from um, some very, very extreme cases. So judges, even if they, if they commit offenses outside of their professional capacity, are rarely held accountable. Uh, they also pointed out that uh, the organization, the whole organization of the National Judiciary Council was uh, faulty. And there's another mention in this document about discipl the disciplinary chamber and disciplinary proceedings. But the main conclusion 
from this document was that we need to change the way uh, the judges are appointed to the council so that they should be appointed by the parliament rather than the community of judges itself because if uh, judges to the council are elected by uh, judges themselves the sort of corporate uh, mechanisms that have been criticized will uh, persevere will continue so we were in conflict uh, with the civic platform, with Donald Tusk. But I would say, even though we had a certain conflict of views, I completely shared those conclusions about the judiciary. That's why our government decided to introduce changes. Uh, we also believe that uh, a, cer a certain corporate structure was created as we were leaving the communist era, which was natural. But now balance has shifted towards closing off the judiciary as a separate corporation, so to speak, uh, that was completely outside of any other external mechanisms of control. That's why we proposed, according to what uh, the civic platform um, uh, called for in the document back then so that the judges to the National Judiciary Council were so elected by the parliament. But according to the Spanish model, uh, actually referring to what uh, the chairman said, who is very experienced uh, as a rapporteur, as the Minister of Justice. Uh, so I believe the Spanish model was a good one to appoint judges to the National Judiciary Council. That's why this is what I was proposed, so that 25, uh, that there are 25 candidates proposed to the parliament, and based on, on that, the parliament chooses by three-fifth uh, uh, majority of votes, just like they do in Spain. What's wrong with that? Is the Spanish mechanism failing? And if it's not failing, I assume it's not. What's wrong in using this example? Uh, there was an accusation that we were uh, trying to interfere with the judiciary. Not the judiciary, but the corporation, the omnipotent corporation that was uh, not really heeding criticism, growing criticism from the society. So the mechanism that's working in Spain we decided to use this experience. We decided to adopt this mechanism. Why are we criticized? I heard that in the report. I heard this criticism in the report. I don't share that. Also, we are guided by the principle that a judge should not uh, uh, pronounce decisions on their own colleagues from the judicial community. Therefore, we introduced another mechanism uh, that was mentioned in Professor Zeplinski's article, like, for example, uh, judges who drive under the influence or who cause or who commit other offenses or misdemeanors. Um, this, for example, there was a case where a judge was caught red-handed as he was stealing a drill from a supermarket. So the Supreme Court back then decided that nothing happened and that judge stayed on the bench. Uh, so these cases really uh, cause an outrage in the society. So, but since the reform has been introduced, many of those cases or many of those judges that committed offenses were brought to justice when there was evidence uh, pointing to their um, to their guilt, and those judges were removed from the uh, profession because they were deemed in conflict with professional and ethical standards and the law. There are no ideal models. We're trying to use solutions from other countries, but we haven't um, moved so far as other European countries like Germany the largest, well, well our, our neighbor. In Germany, uh, Supreme Court judges are actually elected or appointed only by politicians, by representatives of lands, uh, members of the, uh, and the Bundestag, who are in no way bound by 
any other decisions or suggestions or recommendations from the uh, judges community. We cannot elect to the Judiciary Council a judge unless he is recommended by 25 judges. We cannot elect a member of the Supreme Court and a judge in the Supreme Court unless the Judiciary Council, which is mostly composed from judges, not politicians, selects such a candidate and presents it to the president. So, briefly speaking, ladies and gentlemen, in this case, the criticism towards uh, Poland are vastly un unjust and untrue. These, this information uh, takes its source uh, from the very uh, vivid political dispute that uh, is uh, taking place. Por favor, vaya terminando, ministro. Being transferred to the uh, European Parliament. And this, indeed, is the background of the case. And I'm convinced that Polish democracy is doing very well and that the rule of law is doing very well. And I'm also convinced that all the changes in the Polish judiciary serve the purpose of, of it representing a higher level in terms of culture and ethics of the judges uh, uh, and professionalism of their action. And it serves the Polish judiciary right and are consistent with European values. And the recent uh, judgments of the Polish Constitutional Court have quite uh, universally uh, disclosed that uh, the uh, it, where wherever the resolutions of those two chambers were in breach of the Polish uh, constitutions well they they were challenged by the constitutional court uh, by the same token our actions are legitimized by the Polish constitution thank you Bien, eh, en primer lugar, eh, tengo que hacer una especificación y es que el ministro de Justicia podría haber hablado en polaco porque nosotros tenemos servicio de interpretación para que conste y no haya malentendidos. Y en segundo lugar, eh, yo soy española y debo decir a todos los presentes a título informativo que el sistema de acceso general a la, al ejercicio como juez en España se basa, desde un punto de vista general, en un sistema de acceso por oposición y que son muy pocos puestos judiciales tasados en el tiempo y en la forma en los que hay un sistema de designación en el que intervienen también los jueces y el Parlamento. Pero el sistema general de acceso al sistema judicial, a la función judicial en España, es un sistema de oposición. Bien, eh, tiene la palabra en este momento el comisario de Justicia, el señor Didier Reinder. Eh, señor Reinder, ¿nos puede escuchar? Muchísimas gracias, bienvenido. Tiene usted la palabra. Merci, madame la présidente. Merci, monsieur le ministre. Monsieur le rapporteur, madame l'ambassadrice, monsieur le commissaire aux droits de l'homme, mesdames et messieurs les députés, je voudrais vraiment vous remercier de m'avoir invité à participer à cette discussion sur la situation d'état de droit en Pologne. Notre dernière discussion au sein de votre commission pour vous informer de cette situation on remonte au 7 décembre, mais nous avons eu avec ma collègue, la vice-présidente, madame Jourova, l'occasion d'en en reparler en séance plénière en janvier et en février. Alors je veux remercier le ministre de la Justice pour sa participation. Je vais tenter de revenir sur des aspects très concrets des réformes qui ont été mises en place en, en Pologne et des réactions qu'elles ont suscité. Je pense que plusieurs initiatives ont été prises par le Parlement, mais aussi par la, la Commission européenne, avec ensuite des décisions de la Cour de justice. Donc je vais revenir vraiment sur des éléments concrets de, de réforme. Euh, si vous le permettez, je vais le faire d'ailleurs en, en anglais. Uh, as regards the new disciplinary regime for judges in Poland on 8 April, the Court of Justice uh, ruled that Poland must immediately suspend the application of uh, national provisions concerning the powers of the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court. The order, which confirms in full the position of the Commission, applies until the Court will have rendered its final judgment in the pending infringement procedure. 
on 9 April, the first president of the Supreme Court made an official call on the members of the disciplinary chamber to refrain from examining cases and on 20 April she issued an ordinance prohibiting that chamber from uh, examining disciplinary cases. So it was very clear from uh, the President of the Supreme Court to go to a correct application of the uh, ruling from the court. Following the uh, ECG order, a judge of the disciplinary chamber referred a legal question to the Constitutional Tribunal on the constitutionality of provisions of the Treaty on European Union and the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union in particular as regards the obligation of Member States to implement interim measures ordered by the Court of Justice concerning the functioning of con constitutional bodies of the State. Let me underline in that respect that the order of the Court of Justice is binding. It takes immediate effect and must be implemented by the Member States concerned. As made clear by the case law of the Court of Justice, the binding nature of the orders of the Court cannot be questioned on the basis of national laws or rulings of national courts, even on the basis of national constitutional provisions. So we need to have a correct implementation of the decision of the Court of Justice. It's very clear in all the member states and also in such a case. As regards the new law on the judiciary, the Commission has been carefully analysing the final text of the legislation for compliance with EU law. This analysis is now about to be concluded, and I'm convinced that the time for a political decision is approaching. As Justice Commissioner, I will not hesitate to ask the College to take appropriate measures. Let me also turn towards the uh, European Parliament, if I may, with a request. It is important for politicians to explain why the rule of law is important and maybe more important than ever in the times of the COVID-19 crisis. If the judiciary in Poland and the judiciary in the EU will be damaged, it will be more difficult and harmful for citizens and society as a whole to emerge from the crisis. I'm sure that the COVID-19 crisis will raise a range of legal questions for citizens companies and others. To deal with these challenges, we need an independent and functioning judiciary. It is important for politicians to explain it. It seems to be sometimes far from the reality of the citizens in the daily life, but it's very clear that we need to have independent judges and, of course, qualified judges, and certainly in the outcome of such a, a crisis. As regards the first President of the Supreme Court, you will be aware that her term of office will end on 30 April. On 16 April, the spokesperson of the Supreme Court informed that pursuant to the law of the Supreme Court, after 30 April, duties of the first President will be taken over by the judge with the longest seniority until the new first President is appointed. Notwithstanding this, the spokesperson of the President of the Republic indicated that after 30 April, the President will exercise his new right provided under the new law on the Supreme Court and appoint an acting First President who will be tasked with convening the General Assembly to select candidates to the, to the office of the First President. Mesdames et Messieurs les, les députés, Ces développements sont une source de graves préoccupations, car, comme vous le savez, la Cour suprême est considérée comme le dernier bastion de l'indépendance judiciaire en Pologne. Je peux vous assurer que nous serons très attentifs à ce qui se passera dans les prochains jours à cet égard. Another worrying development relates to the fact that the constitutional tribunal has been seized by the government on matters relating to the independence of the Supreme Court. In particular, 
the Constitutional Tribunal has been seized to examine the constitutionality of the Supreme Court resolution of 23 January, which stated that following the preliminary ruling of the Court of Justice of 19 November 19, newly appointed Supreme Court judges, in particular those of the Extraordinary Chamber and of the Disciplinary Chamber, cannot adjudic adjudicate cases. On 20 April, the Constitutional Tribunal decided that the resolution of the Supreme Court of 23 January was void. I would only recall in that respect that as regards preliminary rulings, it is for the referring national court to follow up on the ruling of the Court of Justice. Preliminary rulings of the Court of Justice are binding on all national authorities and courts and need to be fully respected. As regards independence of the Constitutional Tribunal, the position of the Commission is well known. According to the Commission's reasoned proposal adopted under Article 7.1 of the Treaty in 2017, the independence and legitimacy of the Constitutional Tribunal are seriously under, undermined and, consequently, the constitutionality of Polish laws can no longer be effectively guaranteed. By the way, I recall yesterday in the video conference of the General Council that the Commission is at the Council disposal to continue the discussion on the Article 7 process launched by the Vaya terminando, por favor. on Poland and by the European Parliament on Hungary. Madam President, I want finally to say some uh, words about the uh, presidential elections. I'm aware that they are also concerned about the intention of the Polish authorities to hold presidential elections on 10 May. This is an issue that I discussed yesterday with the Polish Commissioner for Human Rights, Adam Bodnar. It is for member states to decide whether to, remain, to maintain or postpone planned elections in the current context. However, any such decisions must be consistent with the member states' obligations under international law and with their constitutional arrangements to guarantee free and fair elections and fully respect the fundamental values set out in Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union. This is essential to ensure the democratic legitimacy of those in power. I would like to underline that the Council of Europe and the Venice Commission provide guidance on good electoral practice, including on the timing of changes to electoral laws and the importance of ensuring a fair campaign as well as a free and circuit ballot. Upholding the standards is essential to ensuring the democratic legitimacy of those in power. In that respect, it is possible to make some observations regarding the relevant standards. And as regards the possibility of campaigning, I note that the OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights has issued on 7 April a statement considering that the current limitations on public gatherings due to the pandemic make campaigning close to impossible. The statement considers that if the presidential election goes ahead under the current circumstances, it may fall short of a number of international standards. And as regards the need for stability of the electoral law, the Venice Commission guidelines on elections state that the fundamental elements of electoral law should not be open to change less than one year before an election. I understand that change has recently been made to the electoral law of Poland, and further changes are currently pending with the Polish Senate, including legislation to enable the extension of postal voting to all Polish citizens, including those living outside of Poland. Pour conclure, Madame la Présidente, la Commission européenne continue de suivre la situation de l'état de droit en Pologne avec inquiétude. Ça s'applique également à la question de la tenue d'élections libres et équitables. Les derniers développements en Pologne confirment une fois de plus l'urgence d'aborder la situation de l'état de droit conformément aux recommandations de la Commission et à celles de la Commission de Venise. La crise de l'état de droit en Pologne est par ailleurs un problème politique qui a peut-être moins de visibilité qu'il ne mériterait 
en raison des derniers développements et vu son impact potentiel sur le système judiciaire européen. Par ailleurs, la Commission est prête à engager un dialogue fondé sur le respect et l'équité avec les autorités polonaises pour résoudre des problèmes en cours. Et je remercie le ministre de la Justice de participer à la séance de, de ce matin. Bien entendu, je reste aussi pleinement déterminé à tenir le Parlement européen et la Commission Libé dûment informés à cet égard. Je vous remercie pour votre attention et je suis évidemment à votre disposition pour répondre à vos questions ou entendre vos observations. Merci, Monsieur Reinders. Bien, le premier que nous devons respecter tous sont les temps. Por favor, sometanse a los tiempos. Eh, me dirijo a la presidencia croata para una actualización del procedimiento del artículo 7.1 en relación con Polonia en el Consejo. El embajador Andrasi tiene la palabra por un máximo de siete minutos. Respeten, por favor, el tiempo. Señor Andrasi, ¿está usted ahí? ¿Puede escucharme, embajador? No, pasamos al siguiente ponente. Un minuto. Vale. Bien, eh, vamos a pasar al siguiente ponente, al profesor Adam Bodnar, comisionado de Derechos Humanos y Defensor del Pueblo de Polonia. Eh, señor Bodnar, ¿nos puede escuchar? Sí, bien. Tiene usted la palabra, por favor, ciñase al tiempo. Tiene usted siete minutos. Bienvenido. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, dear uh, members of the LIBE Committee, dear Madam Chair, dear President uh, López Aguilar, dear Minister of Justice of Poland, I would like to thank you for the invitation to participate in this important meeting of the LIBE Committee. Uh, I represent the Office of the uh, Commissioner for Human Rights, which is the common name uh, Ombudsman. Uh, the Ombudsman in Poland is the independent constitutional authority uh, responsible for safeguarding rights and freedoms uh, of Polish uh, citizens. Uh, I would like to underline that right now my major concern in Poland and my uh, major devotion is to the situation uh, uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, so uh, since the very beginning of the pandemic, I uh, submit a number of uh, statements, general statements to authorities and as well as interventions. So together, uh, over the last six weeks, we've submitted 66 general recommendations and 460 individual uh, interventions and receive number of um, uh, individual uh, cases from people. But I would like to underline that there is a strong connection between the issue of the judicial independence and COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Because at the end of the day, due to the use of emergency measures, due to the different restrictions on, on rights and freedoms, due to different consequences for uh, employees and entrepreneurs, there will be a need for independent judiciary to assess damages, to verify the legality of decisions made by uh, authorities. So I think this issue is really important uh, in this uh, context. I would like to um, underline that for, uh, that for last years, a number of individuals and NGOs are fighting for judicial independence uh, in Poland. And it seems to me that a number of actions taken by the EU were a result of the pressure coming from the Polish civil society and judicial association. And I'm grateful to the European Commission for listening to voices of the Polish society and for bringing actions for concerning violation of judicial independence standards. I'm grateful that the Court of Justice of the European Union is treated as the court which is preserving rights of Polish citizens. And I'm also grateful to the European Parliament for its ongoing interest and different resolutions adopted on the rule of law situation in Poland. But still, despite all those different legal actions and pressure, in my opinion, the judiciary is under threat, and it is not just the fate of individual judges, because further the deterioration of standards may lead towards changing the system of power in Poland into the system of illiberal democracy. Moreover, I argue that it is not only a threat to Poland, but also for the whole European uh, Union. And in recent parliamentary debates, I was saying that uh, 
uh, adoption, for example, of the Mazel law may lead towards... Oh. Me parece que tenemos un problema de conexión. Vamos a intentar verificar que podemos volver al, a la intervención del profesor Bodnar. Sí. Ok, ok, so can I continue? Ok. Uh, so I was saying that uh, the whole situation is a threat not only to Poland, but also for the whole European Union. And recently in parliamentary debates, I was presenting a view that uh, this whole situation may lead towards so-called legal polexit. By legal polexit, I mean a situation when Poland is keeping its membership in the European Union, but is not participating in different legal procedures, especially judicial cooperation between member states. And the recent February decision by the Karlsruhe Regional Court on uh, uh, non-following uh, the European arrest uh, warrant orders and not surrendering uh, Polish individuals to Poland uh, is just a good example of uh, this threat we are already facing. But let me concentrate on just a few uh, issues. So the first of all, I would like to, uh, to underline the, the recent uh, interim measure preliminary ruling by the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court concerning the disciplinary chamber, uh, the interim measure by the, by the Court of Justice of the European Union concerning the disciplinary chamber of the uh, Supreme Court. I would like to underline that this interim measure is binding to all state authorities. The measure has been already implemented by the first president of the Supreme Court, which recalled adjudication of any cases by this disciplinary chamber. But interestingly, the prime minister has announced that it is going to challenge provisions of the uh, of um, challenge provisions allowing for the issuance of this preliminary ruling to the Polish Constitutional Court, claiming that the Court of Justice was acting ultra virus in this regard. And we are also not certain whether the position concerning disciplinary chamber, which was adopted by the first president of the Supreme Court, will be kept by the future first president of the Supreme Court. So I think this issue is extremely important from the point of view of efficiency of the European Union law. If the Court of Justice is saying that Polish authorities, all of them, should follow uh, judgments of the Court of Justice, then it is the primary obligation stemming from the value of the EU law to follow those obligations. The second point is the Muzzle Law. Uh, the Muzzle Law, as everybody knows, entered into force. It provides several restrictions on freedom of speech of judges. It provides restrictions on uh, possibility by judges to directly apply the EU law and asking uh, preliminary references. The, uh, the law strengthens the disciplinary mechanism against uh, judges uh, and makes this mechanism much more political. And as we all know, a number of institutions have expressed their concern concerning the Muzzle Law, including the uh, Special Rapporteur on Judicial Independence of the United Nations, including Venice Commission, including uh, OSCE, ODIR in uh, Warsaw, as well as High Commissioner for Human Rights or Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe. And I think what, uh, but what seems to me is that the reaction by the European Commission was not sufficient as of now. I remember well the visit by the President Viera Jourova uh, to Poland when she was heavily interested in this uh, issue, but later on somehow the Commission didn't start infringement proceedings, and I think that it is the only possibility to stop the operation of this law. The third point I would like to refer to is the res situation, legal situation, after the resolution of so-called three chambers of the Supreme Court, so all those judges of the Supreme Court that were pre appointed by the National Council of uh, Judiciary in its previous uh, composition. It was one of the most important judicial pronouncements in the Polish history. It was act of dignity of almost 60 judges, a historical moment. However, it seems to me that now th there are different actions undertaken in order to devaluate importance of this statement, and especially the recent decisions of the Constitutional Court are just an example of this. Uh, and uh, I would like to underline that in those cases that were pending before the Constitutional Court, I have submitted my uh, statements, and I have also submitted motions to exclude some judges, 
because some of them were just recently members of the parliament, and right now they are acting as judges of the constitutional court. In my opinion, they should not be party to those proceedings because of their direct involvement into the judicial reform in Poland. Next point is the situation of the National Council of Judiciary. Uh, we know that in the meantime, lists of supports for candidates of the National Council of Judiciary have been discussed. Vaya, vaya terminando, por favor, eh? Yes. We know already that uh, what was the involvement of the Minister of Justice into arrangement of those lists of judicial uh, candidates. Uh, European Network of Councils of Judiciary has recently submitted NCJ, and still there are no legislative changes concerning the status of this organ. And finally, uh, I would like to say that uh, presidential elections obviously are extremely important. Uh, this decision to organize so-called all postal voting will violate numerous constitutional standards. We are right now in so-called, I would name it, hybrid extraordinary state. And in fact, in my opinion, elections should not be organized at all during this uh, stage. But importantly, from the point of view of the rule of law, the validity of elections will be decided by Chamber of Extraordinary Appeal and Public Affairs of the Supreme Court. And few t a few days ago, a group of prominent former judges called that only judges appointed by the previous National Council of Judiciary should participate in adjudication on validity of elections, and that the Chamber of Extraordinary Appeal and Public Affairs of the Supreme Court should not uh, participate in this process just because of this unclear process of nomination of the National Council of uh, Judiciary. So I think it is one of the central elements of the, pre, uh, on the, of the current discussion. To conclude, despite the pressure by the Court of Justice of the European Union and brave, brave actions by Polish judges to defend their constitutional position, we observe further deterioration of rule of law standards and it is not a risk just for Poland, but for the whole European Union, being a community based on similar standards, including democracy and rule of law. Second, we should uh, really take care about uh, explaining the status of the extraordinary uh, control chamber uh, because of its impact on the validity, on the potential decision on the validity of presidential elections in Poland. And finally, we can talk about all different things concerning uh, relationship between Poland and the European Union, but the primary objective of Polish authorities being... So sorry, Poland we will finish. Yes, so just one sentence. The primary obligation of the Polish authorities is to respect European Union law. And preliminary injunction is just... Muchísimas gracias por su intervención, señor Bodnar. Les repito, por favor, aténgase a los tiempos. Tenemos un tiempo limitado. Así que me dirijo ahora a la presidencia croata. Eh, embajador Andrasi. ¿Está usted ahí? Ah, bienvenida. Tiene usted la palabra por siete minutos, por favor. Thank you very much, Chair. Sorry for the technical problems with the connection uh, just a minute ago. Uh, honorable members, uh, Commissioner Reinders, uh, glad to be with you today. And let me stress all, uh, at the outset that rule of law plays a crucial role in all our democracies. And as we recalled in our strategic documents, strategic agenda, the program of the presidency, the rule of law is always emphasized as a cornerstone of the EU functioning and a key guarantor that our common values are well protected and complied with. It is our joint responsibility of EU institutions and member states alike to ensure that respect for the rule of law is strengthened and that rule of law remains the cornerstone of our project especially now in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. It's more important than ever that we discuss these issues under these unprecedented circumstances um, that led many member states to adopt far-reaching measures which are key to uh, act very rapidly and effectively to protect the public health of our citizens and, as we know, the influence of public life uh, on a daily basis 
uh, the life of our citizens, and now uh, at this moment, uh, they uh, uh, are as well something that we have to pay close attention to, because it's also essential that these measures are proportionate, um, that they are limited in time, they are subject to regular scrutiny, and that are, they are all in line with fundamental rights and the rule of law. Um, we are uh, aware of the resolution and we welcome the resolution adopted by the Parliament on the 17th of April, which actually echoes these principles. But these principles are as well echoed it in the activities of the Presidency and of the Council in uh, the recent weeks. So uh, we are glad that the Commission also continues to monitor on an equal footing all the measures taken by all member states. And uh, this is something that we had an opportunity to exchange on during uh, last week's in our video conferences, Ministers of Justice and uh, yesterday, our Ministers of European Affairs, where we uh, exchanged views with all the Ministers and uh, on the measures taken in the Member States, in various sectors, very horizontally, always, uh, yesterday, but also our Ministers of Justice discussed uh, the measures that are uh, um, relevant for the justice frameworks and our justice systems. Um, in, this, in this regard, uh, the independence of the judiciary uh, has been stressed as of crucial importance for the rule of law. And it's also key to ensure the application of EU law and sound functioning of our EU legal order. Several recent judgments by the court uh, in Luxembourg have made clear the Member States must respect union principles when implementing domestic justice reforms and that union institutions have a role in monitoring this. It is also an essential foundation of the EU legal order that judgments and orders by the court are timely and soundly implemented by the Member States. And, as you are aware, Article 7 of our treaty procedure uh, concerning Poland um, is uh, one of the procedures that uh, we uh, remain seized of in the Council. Um, with respect to Poland, there was uh, three hearings uh, already in June, September, December of 2018, after the process was launched in February of 2018. Um, at our General Affairs Council. And subsequently, the Council was kept regularly informed how, how the situation was unfolding. Updates on the state of play were discussed uh, in the General Affairs Council um, continuously in the course of 2019 as well. Um, Article 7 procedure uh, was also, as you are aware, uh, on the agenda of uh, Gender Affairs Council on the last 25th of March. However, due to the COVID emergency situation, unfortunately this meeting could not take place um, and we could therefore uh, not uh, hold this uh, discussion. Um, the emergency situation, unfortunately, as you know, is still not over, and for the time being, uh, it's not possible to hold a formal council meeting, but instead, as I mentioned, we are uh, uh, holding a formal uh, meeting of ministers through video conferences, and uh, we can uh, discuss urgent issues, including the measures taken by member states that are linked to fundamental rights and the rule of law. So uh, let me, for the end, emphasize that the Council remains seized of uh, Article 7 procedure and uh, of uh, other forms of exchange of views. And Commissioner Reinders, I, I want to thank you for participating in both video conferences of Ministers of Justice and European Affairs uh, uh, yesterday, and uh, we will be uh, keeping you, you as the Parliament also informed uh, on our discussion and situation uh, that uh, we have uh, on our table. So let me stress again that the Presidency and the Council
Council as a whole uh, attach great importance to upholding the rule of law and protection of fundamental rights. Uh, that they are at heart of our concerns, including through these difficult times of COVID. And I can assure you that we will pay particular attention to the views expressed in your debate uh, today. Thank you very much, and I wish you to continue your discussions in a constructive uh, manner, and that we can uh, all uh, conclude the discussion today uh, in, uh, on this very important uh, issue in a way that we exchange uh, views and uh, that we take them into account as well in our further actions and activities. So I thank you very much from the presidency side, and uh, I, I will maybe uh, come back at the end, uh, depending on the, on the, the discussions uh, and the scenario of the debate. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Le han sobrado tres segundos. Muchísimas gracias. Bien. Eh, como ustedes bien, es, bien saben, tenemos muy poco tiempo. Van a intervenir en primer lugar los coordinadores de la Comisión LIBE. Eh, va a hablar en primer lugar la coordinadora del IPP, el, doña Roberta Mechola. Tiene usted la palabra. Dos minutos, por favor, sujétense al tiempo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you to our panel of speakers who joined us uh, today. Um, I will repeat, uh, we are extremely concerned about what is happening in Poland. I say this not only as coordinator uh, of my group in this committee, but also as the standing shadow rapporteur on the Article 7 procedure with Poland. Now, rather than moving to bring Poland back into the fold, back into the heart of the European family, its current political leaders have captured Poland's institutions and are seeking to instrumentalize them in order to the detriment of the values and principles that we in the European Union and Polish citizens hold dear. Now, this House has expressed already strong reservations about the ultimate effects of the Muzzle Law that prescribes that judges must disclose their membership in all associations, including associations of judges, that they must disclose their functions performed in non-profit foundations and many or any membership in parties before they become judges. Now, Ombudsman Bodnar, you have already um, expressed this in your statements, but please can you elaborate uh, further how this Muzzle Law is being enforced and what the ramifications are in terms of Article 11 of the ECHR and Article 12 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. These two articles protect freedom of association. Now, moving to the presidential elections in Poland, again, I ask uh, Mr. Bodnar, can elections be supervised by a politicized extraordinary council and public affairs chamber within the Supreme Court? When this happens, can they really be free and independent? Are we to expect this in an EU member state? And what measures are being taken to ensure that citizens' voters remain secret? We had yesterday also that the ballots have apparently already been printed. And finally, a question to Minister Zobro. Um, Polish judges uh, continue to be shackled by rules that hinder their independence. The ECJ has already expressed itself clearly on rules that lead judges to face disciplinary measures when they turn to ECJ for a preliminary ruling. On April 8th, we saw what the ECJ has ruled with regards to the disciplinary chamber, but can we get some more information as to what has happened with the stipulation of this one-month deadline for compliance. Is Poland going to comply and free its judges from disciplinary measures that are unheard of in any other member state? Gracias, señora Mechola. Por el S&D, la señora Birgit Sipel tiene la palabra. Señora Sipel, puede escucharme. Bienvenida. Mrs. Sipel. Can you hear me? Oh. Yes? Mrs. Sipel? In Poland are not only under threat, they are hiding away. Sorry, I have to turn to German. So, Demokratie und Rechtsstaatlichkeit werden in Polen immer weiter eingeschränkt. Und ich finde es erschreckend, dass wir wieder einen Vertreter der polnischen Regierung gehört haben, der uns 18 Minuten unserer Zeit gekostet hat, 
ohne konkret auf die Veränderungen der letzten Tage und Wochen einzugehen, mit alten Anekdoten zu argumentieren, die für sich genommen Einzelfälle sind und selbst wenn sie stimmen, keine Rechtfertigung für diese Reformen sind, die wir in den letzten Monaten erlebt haben. Ich finde es fast schon lächerlich, dass diese Regierung jeden Tag über Demokratie und Rechtsstaatlichkeit lästert, die Justiz schlecht redet, Richter persönlich angreift, um die so selbst erzeugte Unzufriedenheit dann zu nutzen, weitere Veränderungen der Justiz und Verschlechterungen der Justiz hinzunehmen. Ich finde das unerträglich und ich spare mir weitere Fragen an den Minister. Ich bin aber auch enttäuscht von den Äußerungen eines Herrn Reinders. Im Ernst? Es ist an den Mitgliedstaaten zu entscheiden, wann sie ihre Wahlen stattfinden lassen? Natürlich, aber diese Entscheidungen müssen nicht nur internationalen Standards folgen, sondern sie müssen natürlich auch die eigenen polnischen Regeln und die polnische Verfassung in diesem Falle folgen. Und das genau ist eben nicht gegeben. Und ich hätte mir da klarere Grundlagen von Ihnen gewünscht. Denn wenn Frau Metzola zu Recht fragt, ob denn überhaupt unabhängige Wahlen notwendig und möglich sind, das sind sie nicht. Der amtierende Präsident ist täglich im Fernsehen, während andere Kandidaten keine Chance haben, ihre Kampagne durchzuführen. Und die Frage der Briefwahl, die in mehreren Änderungen immer wieder eingebracht worden ist, auch dies ist unsäglich. Und offenbar sind auch die ganzen Verfahren in der Hand des stellvertretenden Premierministers und die Wahlkammer hat keinen Einfluss mehr darauf, was da passiert. Insofern hätte ich mir ein klareres Statement gewünscht. Auch die Stellungnahme des Rates ist wie immer wischiwaschi. Wir sind nicht mehr in der Lage, dass wir miteinander reden. Der Worte sind genug gewechselt. Rat und Kommission müssen endlich klare Schritte tun und Konsequenzen ziehen aus dem, was wir in Polen und leider auch in anderen Ländern erleben. Eine Frage vielleicht noch an den Ombudsmann. Mich würde interessieren, welche Möglichkeiten gibt es zum jetzigen Zeitpunkt noch Einfluss zu nehmen, faire Wahlen zu ermöglichen? Und können Sie uns auch etwas sagen zu der Frage von LGBTI-freien Zonen und wie ist Ihre Bewertung, wie wirkt sich das in der Praxis aus, wenn ständig von LGBTI-Ideologie gesprochen wird? Vielen Dank. I've been listening to the, the Polish minister and it's a bit of, you know, something in between uh, a theater play and propaganda, just 18 minutes of mudslinging at judges rather than answering to the concerns. And I think we should be clear, you know, we've been analyzing for many years. We have rulings by the ECJ. Uh, we have statements by the Council of Europe, the Parliament, Article 7 by the Commission, uh, the European Network of Councils of the Judiciary, um, Venice Commission. I think that is abundantly clear. We don't need to discuss the details here. The judiciary in Poland is no longer independent. The elections will not be free and fair. Poland does not meet the Copenhagen criteria. So we basically have a massive rule of law crisis in the European Union. Uh, and the question is how the European Union institutions are going to respond. Um, Parliament and Commission have taken position, but what is the Council doing? I've been listening to the Council presidency, who's just going, you know, the Council attaches great importance to the rule of law, fundamental rights, blah, blah, blah. What is the Council going to do? You are ignoring the situation in Poland. You're ignoring the situation in Hungary. And like gangrene, this is spreading in the European Union and eroding the community of law that we are supposed to be. Um, so I would like to get a clear answer, both from the minister and also from the commissioner. Will the minister, will the Polish government uh, respect the ruling, the interim orders by the European Court of Justice? Yes or no? Uh, If Polish, Poland does not respect that, what is the Commission going to do? What actual actions will you take? And then a second question to the Commission. Um, we have seen that the COVID crisis has led the Commission to, to change the rules, to change the conditions, for example, of the Stability and Growth Pact. Don't you think that a rule of law crisis would also merit changing the rules uh, temporarily? Because it's quite difficult to explain why the Polish government is getting massive amounts of money, which is basically only supporting their corrupted government, uh, whereas we should actually be supporting 
NGOs, for example, free media. So is the Commission willing to look at conditionality and maybe even create a special crisis fund to support democracy uh, in these times of rule of law crisis? Thank you. Gracias, señora Inderfeld. Por el Grupo ID, eh, el señor Nicolás Bey, ¿está usted conectado? ¿Puede escucharme? No, not connected. No está conectado. Vamos a pasar a, a la representante de, al representante del Grupo de los Verdes, Terry Reinke. ¿Está usted conectado? ¿Puede escucharme? Ok. Yes. Tiene usted la palabra. Fine. Can you hear me? Let me start by saying, uh, all of you, uh, I hope that you are do to all of you, I hope that you are doing well and you are in good health, really from the bottom of my heart in these difficult times. Um, before I start asking my question, I would also have uh, two remarks, and um, this is really voicing a frustration that I have been um, having for a couple of years now. When we are speaking in this dialogue about the situation in Poland, I think there are two strategies very often to respond to criticism. And the first one is, and we have seen that today again is uh, basically the situation was even worse before and it's all the opposition's fault and the second strategy is to take bits and pieces of uh, the functioning of the judiciary from other member states and trying to put them into the situation in Poland and saying you know in other member states this is possible as well and all of these strategies are not working out because what we need are very concrete responses to the concerns that are not only voiced by the European Parliament and the European Commission, but also, for example, by the Venice Commission and many other international human rights bodies. So I would really urge the Polish government to focus on this and to try to be clear on these points. Now, I would like to pose a question to the Commissioner uh, on several issues. You have mentioned the presidential elections. I think for us it would be interesting to know what other other than a dialogue the Commission would push for uh, if these elections go ahead uh, as planned. Secondly, I would like to ask with regards to the, the disciplinary chamber if the Commission agrees that the, the recent ruling of the Constitutional Tribunal um, does not comply with the ECJ ruling and what will you do about it. Um, it has been mentioned the primacy of European Union law um, is the foundation of this very project. Um, so my question to the Commission is uh, what do you do um, to uphold um, the role of the uh, European Court of Justice in this regard? And then lastly, this has also been mentioned before, the very concerning um, proposals that have been put forward in the Polish Parliament on sex education and on restriction of the abortion law. I would like to ask the Commission whether they see this as a restriction of fundamental rights, because as you know, Polish citizens are European citizens, they have rights. And uh, let me finish by saying that um, I want to very broadly salute and thank all the Polish citizens who are standing up for rule of law and fundamental rights right now. I know the situation is difficult. We are watching you and we are right behind you from the European Parliament. Thank you. Gracias. Vamos a intentar la conexión con Nicolás Bey del Grupo ID. ¿Está usted conectado? No. Bien, vamos a seguir entonces con el representante del grupo ICR, eh, con tampoco, sí. señor Yaki, bienvenido, tiene usted la palabra. Dziękuję bardzo. Szanowni Państwo, już te, tradycyjnie podczas dyskusji o Polsce padło tu tyle kłamstw i bzdur, że to naprawdę ciężko by było, nie, ma, nie mam czasu, żeby to wszystko prostować, no ale po kolei spróbujmy. Członkowie rządu, Państwo twierdzicie, że w Polsce są powoływani na sędziów. Przecież to bzdura. Proszę pokazać konkretnie kto. Druga bzdura. Członkowie rządu, yy, że to coś nadzwyczajnego, że członkowie rządu są w KRS, która wybiera sędziów. Czy Państwo najpierw sprawdźcie, zanim yy, yy, rzucacie takie oskarżenia, bo to wynika wprost z konstytucji, że minister Sprawiedliwości jest członkiem KRS-u i tak było również wcześniej. Po, po, po trzecie, mówicie, że za że zastosowanie prawa europejskiego są wszczynane procedury dyscyplinarne wobec sędziów. Chodzi prawdopodobnie o, te, o py, tak zwane pytania prejudycjalne. To sprawdźcie, że mamy już w tym zakresie orzeczenie CUE, które to odrzuciło wniosek polskich sędziów. Dlaczego o tym nie mówicie albo nie sprawdziliście? Mówicie o tym, że głosowanie za pomocą poczty stwarza zagrożenia dla demokracji. To bardzo ciekawe, skoro w poprzednich wyborach parlamentarnych w Niemczech głosowało prawie 9 milion, 10 milionów ludzi w ten sposób, a 
Niedawno w czasie koronawirusa odbyły się wybory w Bawarii, gdzie przeprowadzono całe wybory w ten sposób. To co? To w Niemczech można, a w Polsce nie można? Na podstawie jakiego traktatu? Ponadto po raz kolejny Państwu przypominam, że nie ma żadnych ustaw rządowych dotyczących aborcji czy dotyczących edukacji seksualnej. To są ustawy obywatelskie nieprzyjęte w tej kadencji, a ustawy obywatelskie muszą być procedowane. Ponadto mówicie Państwo, Pan Minister Ziobro świetnie Państwu pokazał, że w Polsce w Polsce rada jest wyłaniana w taki sam sposób jak w Hiszpanii. A tutaj padł argument taki, no ale w Hiszpanii jest konkurs. A wiecie, że w Polsce też jest? I co? Dodatkowo chcę Państwu powiedzieć, no to co komisarz Reinders już opowiada, to znaczy ja Panie Komisarzu chyba tylko wypada, że ja się zapytał, czy Pan może nie chce nam przesyłać prawa, które w Polsce byśmy tylko wdrażali, po co w ogóle tej Polska jest, po co w ogóle polski parlament. Mówi Pan, o, mówi pan komisarz o tym, że że, że, że o orzeczeniu CUE. Proszę bardzo, dlaczego pan komisarz nie wspomina o tym, że w orzeczeniu CUE jest jasno napisane, że nie można kwestionować statusu polskich sędziów powołanych przez prezydenta, a pan to w tej chwili robi. To pan stosuje orzeczenie CUE, czy nie? No proszę się tutaj proszę się wypowiedzieć. No tych bzdur tutaj padło jeszcze naprawdę wiele, ale szanowni państwo, państwo ciągle uważacie, że znacie, dostaliście kilka briefów i znacie Polskę lepiej od Polaków. No, bardzo Państwa proszę o refleksję w tym zakresie. Dziękuję. Gracias, señor Jackie. Bien, intentamos de nuevo la conexión con Nicolás Bay. ¿Está conectado? No, seguimos adelante. Bien, eh, por el GUE tiene la palabra la, la señora Dalí. Tiene usted. ¿La palabra está conectada? Está en la sala. Yeah. Thanks. Es que tenemos contraluz. Thanks, chair. Um, yeah, I mean, this morning's contributions were really incredible in some ways. I mean, I'm, I'm still in shock having listened to the Polish minister. I mean, the idea that we listen to 10 minutes of Polish judges being described as corrupt drunks who go around stealing drills from supermarkets is utterly bizarre. And even if it were true, it wouldn't justify the changes that have been brought in. That's not an excuse for the abolition of powers, the separation of powers, and it's certainly not an excuse or, uh, for dealing with situations where judges who implement court of justice rulings get disciplined as a result. That's not because they're drunk or steal drills. They get disciplined because they implement court of justice rulings. Now, what is the Commission going to do about that if that situation continues? It's clear to me that Article 7 proceedings have been underway for years now, but it hasn't made a blind bit of difference. In actual fact, the Muslim law not only penalised judges, but has been accompanied by a really vicious smear and online harassment campaign to those judges who try and oppose it. And this, sadly, isn't new. In actual fact, uh, an Irish judge was viciously uh, criticised and smeared for dealing with a uh, referring an extradition warrant case to the um, European Justice Court in a similar way with her personal life and her sexuality being questioned. So this isn't new. So what I'd like to know is, yes, on one level, the Commission were a little bit more you know, clearer today that a lot of the behaviour was unacceptable. But what is actually being done And I'd like to know what concretely is the Commission going to do to deal with a situation where we have the possibility of a very unfair election? Because COVID-19 means civil society is, is restricted. All opposition groups have stopped their campaigning. The incumbent president is on television morning, noon and night, and the body overseeing the legality of the elections has uh, been uh, subject to new rules which are questionable. This is an outrageous situation. I'd like an opinion on that, and I'd like to know what the Commission is going to do about the new laws criminalising abortion and sexuality. We know these are going through the Parliament, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be open to uh, criticism or that the, the Commission should should stay silent. These are huge violations of human rights. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, ask the Ombudsman very quickly, what would he think we should do in this situation? He's an exemplary public servant. Gracias, señora Dalí. Último intento de conexión con el señor Bay. No, no, no está conectado. Bien, vamos a ver. Los ponentes invitados tienen ahora tiempo para poder responder a las preguntas. El ministro de Justicia... Eh, Señor Chobro, Jobro, tiene eh, la primera palabra y cinco minutos. Señor Jobro, ¿está usted ahí?
¿Me pueden escuchar? Yes, I'm Thank here. you. Uh, hello. Issue number one. Uh, Minister Jobro has had to leave. Uh, he has been held by other uh, obligations, real uh, sh combat against the coronavirus. We have a special team appointed for that purpose, so he has had to leave. Now, with regard to your positions, it is a lie, first of all, that Polish judges have disciplinary actions for preliminary ruling questions. There isn't a single disciplinary proceeding as such. There is a case, but it is uh, at the Supreme Court at the moment, and such proceedings have been initiated by the first president of the Supreme uh, Court, uh, Ms. Gerstov, against uh, Judge Zaratkiewicz, who asked in his uh, preliminary ruling question whether it is admissible to arbitrarily exclude judges that have been democratically elected by the Democratic National uh, Council of J Judiciary by uh, judges and replacing them with judges who have been selected by the corporate uh, chambers. And that uh, disciplinary proceedings are being held against this judge, but there isn't a single one against those who issue preliminary questions uh, to uh, the ECJ. Uh, line number two, uh, Ombudsman Botnar is misleading you. It is not true that the Polish law allows for the possibility of penalizing uh, preliminary uh, questions, uh, preliminary learning questions. Art, uh, the article of the disciplining law uh, provides for disciplinary uh, proceedings being held against uh, judges who are in flagrant breach of the law. In your countries, would you accept cases where judges are free to break the law? Would you approve situations where one judge can undermine the status quo of, a di of another judge and cannot be held accountable for that? Would you approve a situation where a judge may be uh, free to suspend a constitutional body or, or the law, the use of law, would you accept anarchy and chaos in your countries? Please respond to that question. This uh, act is to protect uh, the law and order. It is not an, a muzzle law. It is, uh, its job is to protect the rule of law in Poland. The next question. And here, uh, a clarification, Ombudsman Bodnar uh, pointed out, and that is another law lie, that uh, the Constitutional Court judges uh, that have been selected were members of Parliament. Uh, yes, they were prior to that, but if you look at the uh, resumes of many opposition uh, MPs who ended up in the Constitutional Court, they were. Uh, judge Stempien uh, used to be a judge in the Constitutional He used to be a Minister of the Interior before Judge Kieras, uh, he used to be a senator, and then he was a judge of the Constitutional Court. Uh, judge Yamros, he used to be an MP. He, he was a Secretary of State in the Ministry of Education, and then he was a judge of uh, the same court. Mr. Niemcevich, again, he used to be an MP, and then in 2003, he was a court. That is something that Ombudsman will not tell you, so please be reliable. Now, regarding uh, the uh, CGU uh, uh, decision of the 19th of November 2019, Article 145 reads uh, explicitly that the decision of the President on the appointment of the Supreme Court judges cannot be challenged. Uh, and meanwhile, what has happened in our country? An attempt of anarchy by a group of judges who have described themselves as an extraordinary group, hand in hand with the opposition. They have started challenging the status of other elected judges. They interfered with the, question, uh, with the competence of the head of states. So we had to put a stop to it and we had to implement clear rules, which are in this case are binding, and they in no way... Uh, interfere with the independence of the judges. Quite the opposite. They protect the independent uh, rule of law and our constitution. Uh, moreover, the uh, judgment of uh, CGEU, uh, we read in point 130 that there isn't a single model of councils of the judiciary or disciplinary chambers in the EU. And that's why what you have asked, the decision of uh, the recent uh, Court of Justice decision gives uh, the Polish government 30 days to respond. Now, let me uh, point out that this decision, the, its status had been acknowledged in the last uh, uh, judgments of the uh, Constitutional Tribunal. It has the last say. Our uh, constitutional uh, courts uh, stated so in 2011 with uh, Judge Rapliński and uh, 
po- they claimed quite clearly that the Polish constitution overrides the European Union law on the territory of Poland. So the constitutional court has already heard this issue. Now, therefore, let's deal with real problems uh, when what is real is the uh, combat against COVID-19. And I'm getting a lot of messages from my friends in Italy. Uh, currently, the situation in Europe... Pe- perdone, um, vamos a, a tener que cortar, pero el resto de las respuestas puede enviárnoslas por escrito y lo agradeceremos um, muy profundamente. Muchísimas gracias. Of, uh, high officials of EU uh, that are very highly paid by, let's say, 50% and uh, earmarking these funds. Bien, eh, el resto de los ponentes, por favor, eh, sometanse al tiempo. Van ustedes a tener dos minutos y medio y las respuestas que no puedan eh, emitir puedan enviarlas por escrito. Igual que indicaremos también al, al ministro de Justicia para que lo que no haya podido expresarse se exprese a esta Comisión de Libertades Civiles. Señor Reinders, ¿está usted conectado? Oui, voilà. Normal. Vous avez la parole, merci. Vous avez la parole, merci. Merci simplement. Je remercie d'abord les, les membres du, du Parlement européen pour, pour leurs interventions euh, et demandant surtout comment on peut agir euh, concrètement dans un certain nombre de, de cas concernant l'état de droit. Je voudrais d'abord rappeler que les procédures d'infraction auxquelles beaucoup de, de parlementaires ont fait allusion ont été introduites par la Commission. Et si nous avons obtenu une décision sur les procédures disciplinaires, c'est à la demande de, de la Commission au début de cette année. Et la décision de la Cour de justice, comme je l'ai rappelé, s'impose aux autorités polonaises. Et donc il faudra que toutes les autorités polonaises respectent cette décision de suspendre les procédures disciplinaires. Euh, si euh, ces procédures disciplinaires n'étaient pas suspendues, il y a évidemment des moyens d'action, notamment en matière astreinte devant la, la Cour de justice. Mais nous en sommes pour l'instant à la période d'un mois pendant laquelle nous attendons des autorités polonaises de respecter la décision de la Cour de justice. De la même façon, concernant la mesure law, comme on l'a appelé, la dernière loi sur l'organisation judiciaire, nous sommes prêts à prendre des dispositions au sein du Collège. L'analyse de la, de la législation est terminée, donc le Collège aura rapidement à se prononcer sur d'éventuelles procédures d'infraction. Enfin, en ce qui concerne les élections, je voudrais aussi dire que j'étais très précis dans l'analyse de la situation. La loi est pour l'instant à l'examen au Sénat en Pologne, mais il est évident que nous avons un grand nombre de préoccupations à l'égard de l'organisation des élections le 10 mai. C'est la raison pour laquelle j'ai encore confirmé hier à la présidence du, du Conseil, lors du débat au Conseil Affaires Générales, que nous étions prêts à participer à une nouvelle discussion sur base de la procédure en cours au départ de l'article 7 du traité, parce qu'il est important qu'avec le Conseil, on puisse analyser la situation de la tenue de ces élections qui posent effectivement des problèmes non seulement dans l'organisation de l'élection elle-même, mais bien entendu dans la tenue d'une campagne qui soit correcte, loyale, entre l'ensemble des, des candidats, ce qui apparemment, et beaucoup d'organisations internationales l'ont remarqué, n'est pas praticable aujourd'hui. De la même façon, je voudrais dire que nous sommes très attentifs à l'évolution d'un certain nombre de propositions de loi en ce qui concerne notamment le droit à l'avortement, mais d'autres aspects de la, la vie de la société polonaise. Et dans ce contexte-là, nous travaillons avec la société civile pour voir comment faire en sorte que l'on évite d'avancer dans, dans ces matières d'une manière qui restreigne les droits, certainement encore plus pendant cette période de crise liée au Covid-19. Mais nous travaillons sur ces thèmes, même si, vous le savez, les compétences de l'Union en la matière ne sont pas très étendues, mais nous avons la charte des droits fondamentaux qui peut servir de, de référence. Et enfin, euh, plusieurs questions ont été posées sur euh, des mesures très concrètes, notamment en matière de financement. Ce filet de fait des revenus sur le, le sujet. Je rappelle que la Commission a proposé une conditionnalité dans la discussion sur le cadre financier pluriannuel. Et nous souhaitons vraiment que cette conditionnalité entre l'état, l'état de droit, le respect de l'état de droit dans les États membres et les financements venant du cadre financier pluriannuel soit réellement euh, introduite avec une proposition d'une majorité qualifiée renversée ce qui donne une plus grande efficacité par rapport aux procédures que nous connaissons aujourd'hui. Donc il y a toute une série d'actions que la Commission peut entreprendre. Je l'ai souvent dit, ces actions sont d'autant plus efficaces qu'elles sont soutenues, comme vous le faites, 
par le Parlement européen, si elle peut aussi... Si elle peut... Eh, si el comisario tiene algunas cosas más que aportar, lo puede hacer por escrito. Nos vemos abocados a hacerlo porque el tiempo, por las circunstancias, está tasado. Bien, eh, embajadora Andrasi, ¿está usted conectada? Gracias, tiene la palabra. Yes, we are connected. Thank you very much. And uh, just uh, let me thank uh, everybody for this uh, useful discussion. And as I said, the council will remain seized of the matter. And we look forward as well to the continuation of our exchanges of views um, with member states, with the Commission, and their monitoring of the situation in the member states and of the measures also related to COVID. And uh, we also would like to uh, uh, invite uh, that the dialogue that exists uh, between the Commission uh, 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 and the member states, including Poland, is continuing, both at the political and technical level, and we hope uh, that uh, this dialogue can also bear fruit and we find solutions. Uh, so thank you very much once again, uh, and uh, we uh, continue to uh, be uh, um, seized of the with you uh, in the Parliament as well, and uh, we will continue informing you on the developments. Thank you very much. A usted. El señor Adam Bodnar, ¿está usted conectado? Tiene usted la palabra. Dos minutos y medio, por favor. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your interest in uh, issues concerning human rights protection in Poland. I will just be extremely brief. First of all, obviously, the compulsory disclosure of the membership in judicial association violates uh, Article 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, I was presenting this view in the Parliament, and I know that some judges are basically refusing to comply with this law, and possibly they risk disciplinary proceedings because of this, but for them it is an uh, act of protecting their rights. Uh, second, there, was a, there were different statements concerning, uh, allegedly that I'm sharing some lies concerning members of the parliament uh, becoming uh, judges of the uh, Constitutional Court. Obviously, it was a pre-practice. It happened uh, quite a few times that uh, former members of the parliament became uh, judges of the Constitutional Court. But here, what I, what I was meaning is that architects of judicial changes in Poland, like Mr. Piotrowicz and uh, Mrs. Uh, Pawłowicz, So people who became faces of those ongoing rule of law attacks for the last couple of years are now deciding cases that concern uh, the situation of the judiciary. It is a problem that they were involved. I don't have a problem with them being judges. I have a problem with the fact that they are adjudicating cases concerning uh, judicial independence. The next point uh, is um, about uh, elections. Obviously, you cannot prepare elections complying with all Uh, standards, if you create an uh, uh, obligation to make all postal voting and you pass such laws within w just, just w one month before the date of elections, and even as of now, we do not have a final law. Uh, so the law is right now in the parliament, uh, in the upper chamber of the parliament in, in the Senate. Yesterday I submitted my complex opinion saying that those elections will not be direct, will not be free. Uh, and will not, be, will not secure the secrecy of uh, voting. So, and I do hope that Senate will uh, review uh, all the details concerning this law and that finally the emergency state will be introduced in Poland and uh, that elections will be uh, postponed. So that, that's my uh, point. Uh, and I think we shouldn't refer to the example of Bayern. In, in Bayern, in Bavaria, uh, all postal voting uh, and basically postal voting is, has been introduced and uh, practiced Since 1957, we cannot replace the 60 years of experience of Bavaria with just one month uh, preparation for uh, elections. That is the problem from the point of view of human rights. As regards LGBT free zones, let me allow uh, to answer in writing on this uh, uh, issue. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. Muchas gracias. Esperamos sus respuestas. Presidente López Aguilar, como ponente, ¿está usted conectado? ¿Puede escucharnos? Here I am. Can you hear me? Tiene usted la palabra. Presidente, dos minutos. Todo lo demás lo podrá mandar por escrito. Lo podrá mandar por 
Thank you. First of all, I would like to appreciate all of the points that have been made, including, of course, Minister Zioro, who had to speak to, to escape to fight against COVID. I would like to reassure him that we're all fighting the pandemia. Second, he made a, spe a specific point on the Spanish model. I would like to reassure him, too. The Spanish model was meant to distribute with the three-fifths majority precisely the composition of the Council of the Judiciary. But the Council of the Judiciary is only competent for promoting and disciplinary measures because the access to the judiciary is completely objective, objective rules, so there is no poli po political interference whatsoever. The important thing here is to secure independence, and we are concerned about steps that have been made in order to interfere with the independence of individual judges when adjudicating individual cases, and that's precisely the guarantee that is provided by Article 47 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. But judiciary is not the only concern. We're also concerned about democracy, which means the electoral reform that has been put in place precisely throughout the time of the pandemia against the rulings of the Constitutional Court of, the po of Poland and creating thus democratic concerns and also fundamental rights. What about LGBT free zones? That is an important concern of ours. And finally, of course, we are concerned about abiding European law. We have never seen in the European Union that a government shows contempt towards and against the rulings of its own constitutional court. That has been the case in Poland. And of course, that has also been the case with contempt against the rulings of the European Court of Justice. This is completely unacceptable. When the European Court of Justice sets a ruling, all of the member states are to abide by those rulings because they are to abide by the primacy and direct effect of the European law, which is precisely what is at stake. Finally, as to the procedure ahead, I would like to, of course, make sure that all of the points that have been made are going to be taken into account when drafting the report, that's for sure. And also, I would like to announce that I'm doing my best to get the report ready by mid-July so that it could be voted back to normal, hopefully. Muchísimas gracias, eh, Presidente. Los diputados y diputadas... Tob, Barley, Wismianska, Spurek y Estrugario han pedido la palabra. Lamentablemente no vamos a poder concederla, pero les rogamos que envíen por escrito sus preguntas y el ponente o ponentes a los que las dirigen, y nos aseguraremos de que lleguen las respuestas. Bien, eh, debo anunciarse el resultado del voto de las enmiendas. Las enmiendas presentadas y que ustedes han podido votar han sido rechazadas por 14 votos a favor y 51 votos en contra. El voto definitivo será a las 3 de la tarde, a las 15 horas. Agradezco muchísimo a todos los esfuerzos. Agra Lamento la frustración de algunos de ustedes por la difícil participación o la no participación. Seguiremos nuestra sesión por la tarde. Les agradezco el trabajo y el esfuerzo que están realizando de todo corazón. Seguimos por la tarde.